very pleased to welcome uh, today uh, yeah. Yeppi Lorenzen from uh, Greenland. Uh, fantastic. He's going to talk today about built heritage in Greenland. Uh, Hebe is a Danish national living and working in Greenland and is currently a curator of built heritage and listed buildings with the National Museum of Greenland based in the capital uh, Nuuk, I think. Um, at the museum, curators are responsible for the listing of built heritage in Greenland. In this function, Hepe travels around the country to inspect conditions and maintenance on listed buildings. He also advises building owners, contractors, and architects, and manages permissions for projects on listed buildings, with special regards to choice of materials and correct techniques. Uh, Hepe is a former master carpenter with a wide experience in mo both modern construction and historic restoration and has an MA in history from the University of Copenhagen. He's also active in the ICOMOS Polar Heritage Committee. Um, and I, also, I should also say he's a, he's a member of the uh, ICOMOS International Wood Committee. So again, thanks very much for, for speaking um, with two hats on today, Epe. Um, in his talk today, uh, he will introduce the historical background of built heritage in Greenland and touch upon his work in built heritage management with a focus on some of the challenges that historic building custodians in Greenland typically face there, for example, weather, infrastructure, lack of know-how and funding. Uh, one interesting aspect about the built heritage of Greenland that uh, I hope Hepe might go into today is the hybrid nature of several styles of building through time and how the techniques of building throughout the colonial area gradually adapted to the harsh climate and how Inuit building traditions also changed during the same period. The climate of the Arctic and subarctic has long been fantastic for preserving wood due to a general, generally dry climate. However, this is changing and nowadays they face longer wet seasons with rain and sleet. The wooden historic buildings are not designed to handle this and most lack even the most basic construction protection from rain. So that's enough of me blathering on. Um, over to you, please. And I'm going to finally say, please, everybody, microphones off. Thank you. Well, thank you, Doc. And uh... Well, I could just wrap up the whole uh, thing now because you basically basically covered everything <laughs> in your introduction. But thank you, and thank you everybody for joining uh, us today here, and uh, thank you, Doug, for the big work you're putting into uh, to setting all this up. Really appreciate it. Um, I thought I'd start out with this. Uh, can you see the screen? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I thought I'd start out with this. Uh, Beautiful picture that I took last summer in the south of Greenland to just start everybody up with uh, something that people might not expect from Greenland to see uh, fields of flowers and a summery sky and everything. But uh, if you look closely here in the background, you can actually see two icebergs. So it's uh, it's still still close to the Arctic polar circle at least. So, um, but let's begin. I. Uh, yeah. Um, this timeline is just to uh, sort of uh, build a frame around the, the whole idea of uh, how long have people inhabited Greenland and, and how long have people had to think about how to create homes uh, and shelter from the, from the climate here. Um, I would first ask you to know this, note this uh, vertical black line at the bottom of the timeline. Uh, that's when the uh, the colonization by the Kingdom of Denmark took place in 1721, and it's uh, it's a very important year for what you would call basically the ending of of one type of of living and building and the the beginning of a of another type that is uh, highly influential today. Um, to just to understand this uh, this timeline briefly, the the different colors that you see. Um, are related to um, separate 
peoples or cultures. So it shouldn't be thought of as tribes uh, migrating into Greenland, but it's it's more like uh, different peoples over time uh, making their way primarily from uh, from uh, Arctic Canada, from Nunavut, into the different parts of, of Greenland. And as you can see here in the uh, the, the rosy and blue colored uh, areas, um, some of these migrations have to do with uh, a warmer or colder climate. Um, often uh, with the colder climate, um, at least here, for example, um, ending a period of population in, uh, in Greenland. So a few of these peoples might have been overlapping in time, but you also have quite large gaps in time um, on both sides of uh, year zero here, uh, where archaeologists tell us there's no people lived in Greenland at all. Um, the main difference uh, between what happened during the colonization period and what happened earlier is that to some degree the common denominator of all these uh, cultures are that they are hunter-gatherers primarily, so they uh, they would build homes um, on travels following the animals, for example, or move along um, with, the, with the changing of the seasons Put up, putting up a, a house in the fjords uh, in the winter to hide from the from the harsh storms of the coastline, and then the summertime, moving out on the coast to hunt seals, and and this would affect how many of these people uh, thought of housing and, and, uh, and approach the the building style. Um, we have one strange and short incident uh, in history when in, on the green line here at the bottom. When the Norse, the white Vikings, if you will, when they showed up around year 800, thereabouts, um, they brought a different building style to Greenland. Um, but I won't touch too much up, upon that because that it doesn't really seem in the archaeological or historical material that that there was any um, trade in, in in knowledge or techniques between the the Inuit population and the uh, and the Norse, uh, we still have some ruins, uh, some places in the landscape uh, from from Viking buildings, but uh, but uh, they have mainly been used, at least in the South Greenland, as uh, as quarries for building other houses. Uh, because in the South Greenland, they were built from huge uh, stone blocks, most of the buildings. Um, two things that are uh, important: note the uh, the red area here, we'll talk about that shortly, people moving in about 4,500 years ago and living in the extreme north of Greenland. Um, and the light blue down here. Uh, this is what is commonly called the Tula culture, and these are basically the Inuit population of Greenland today. They moved in shortly after the Vikings and started spreading along the coastline. Um, This would be uh, a typical find from the uh, from the earliest peoples, like the independence uh, to culture, the yellow one at the top here. Um, and you can still find them just sitting in the north of Greenland on the surface. It's 4,500 years ago that these people had a tent here, the stone ring holding down the, uh, the animal skins um, and a fireplace in the middle. Here you see uh, um, an archaeologist's uh, guess at how this construction might have looked like. So basically, this looks the same as when the family 4,500 years ago pulled down the tent and followed the reindeer somewhere else. Um, there's no uh, topsoil in the north of Greenland, and there's almost no precipitation. So nothing gets eroded away. It's just an Arctic desert, basically. I'll just jump back. Another example I have uh, of what a building construction could look like, and this is much more relevant for what we're talking about today, is uh, on the right here. Um, this is what would call what would be called a Tula culture longhouse, where several families would live in here. Um, it looks like it's a hole in the ground, but it's um, actually um, walls built out of uh, a mixture of uh, turf, like a peat house, uh, turf and stone stacked up. Uh, and then you put uh, driftwood or, um, or whale bones on the top, 
and you put the uh, animal skins and stones on top of that also. And you have a really nice, warm and cozy hive. What I would urge you to uh, to notice here is the, the the long, narrow entrance, which you can also see down here. It's um, it's a very low entrance that you would sometimes only be able to crawl through, and this is to conserve heat. Um, that will become important later, so please note the long, narrow entrance. Um, conserving heat uh, and uh, pointing away from the general wind direction and also limiting limiting how many enemies or how many polar bears could get through at one time. Um, that is um, that is a typical find from the Tula culture uh, where people started moving around in, in larger families um, and that affected the, the change from fully nomadic lifestyle of the tent to a more stable lifestyle of the longhouse. We move on uh, through time and so until the um, the colonial uh, period starts around 1721 and it uh, carries on until 1953 where Greenland was uh, fully enclosed in the uh, Danish uh, kingdom or the Danish Commonwealth. Um, the typical colonial houses that we see um, are timber frames or they're block houses. A timber frame green, uh, house in Greenland would normally look like this. You have timber frame beneath and then you have a, uh, a cladding of some kind. It could be, um, uh, later it would be plywood often, but in the earlier period it's uh, uh, like uh, groove and tongue boards on the outside. Um, and normally most houses would, uh, in the early period, have a roof of uh, clinker built uh, boards, or they would have, um, oh, what's the name? It escapes me. Um, shingles. Yeah, shingles. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> I should know this. Um, where, where we see the real difference is uh, between the uh, different types of, uh, of block houses or log houses. Um, where this would this one with obvious damage is, and I'm ashamed to say, called uh, the Danish style. Um, and this is because the uh, the logs are cut halfway through uh, and uh, assembled um, like that, instead of um, the, what we in Greenland call the Norwegian or Swedish style, where it's only a quarter cut. Uh, and this uh, style of cutting halfway through actually exposes um, the joints uh, to a lot of rain and a lot of melt water, uh, at least in the short wet seasons that we have. So this means that they are exposed to rot and, uh, and, and really hard to maintain. Um, the other type which we typically see not as often is, uh, is this one down here, where we uh, where we see the um, the logs uh, held in place by a, by a vertical beam. Um, yeah. We have a small number of stone buildings also. Um, this one in a, in a settlement called uh, actually Tsok. Um, from 1871 and represents an example of a North German building style because it's a church from the Moravian Brotherhood. Uh, and they've built this in what would be a classical Northern European style. Uh, it's a timber frame building. It's got the uh, uh, brick, plastered brick in between uh, and a uh, wooden roof construction of some kind. It's uh, tar paper now, but this would also have been shingles at some point. Um, and the other kind of stone buildings is uh, typically from local stone. Uh, this one is quite nicely built, but uh, they can be very rough uh, sometimes. But it's uh, it's it's roughly hewn uh, local stone um, with a uh, a wooden roof construction on top. This particular building actually used to have a flat roof with a turf roof on. Um, but as the uh, local settlement got richer from uh, trading in, in whale oil, um, the extension of the, of the roof was made. 
but um, but it's it's important to stress that the stone buildings are not very common in Greenland. It's uh, it's few and far between, at least from the colonial period. Um, this is mostly to, just to show you a building that I find really nice. Uh, it's uh, the new church in the northern Greenlandic town called Sisimut. It's a rather large church. Um, and as you can see from the inside, everything is just held in fantastic detail. Everything is made from wood. And the amazing thing about this is that we have no wood. We have no trees in Greenland. Everything is imported. Uh, and this route, this church was paid entirely by the local fishermen um, from a collection made over years and years and years because the town was growing and the church that they had, the old church was really small, but they had this built. Um, and just notice the detail on the, on the, on the beams here and just how nice everything's treated. If, I don't know if you can see it actually, but in the roof, from the, from the picture outside, there's a funny thing that's not that uncommon in Greenland. Because materials are so scarce, you don't just build a new house or a new church if you need it. But very shortly after the new church was built, um, the town grew even more because they had a, sh a shrimp factory. Um, and many people moved there. So the new church was quickly getting too small. So what they did was cut the small section here, cut it from this part of the church, moved it backwards on rollers and built a new section in. So you can actually still see it in the roof, which means that the roof is quite old. So that's all also nice. To touch upon the uh, the topic that Doug was uh, talking about in the introduction, how did these two kinds of approach to a, a building tradition uh, mix and adapt to each other? Well, on the right side here, I mean, this is another kind of peat house. It's not the same as the long house that I was showing you a drawing of in the beginning, but it's based on the same idea. You can see the walls are built up of layers of flat rocks and then uh, the turf or peat. Um, and then this house uh, is a, um, this house is a um, reproduction of what they would look about because we don't have any surviving houses from this era. This would be a typical house from somewhere from the 1830s maybe and all the way up to in some places the 1980s. Um, Few people in the 80s would live like this, but some did. Um, and what you can see here is that the uh, the adaption to the new techniques, of, for example, being a, a chimney to uh, lead the smoke away from the stove, which was a new thing. Otherwise, the heating in the traditional houses would be a steel oil lamp. Um, but with um, things like windows and uh, and doors, you know, like real doors instead of a very low crawling entrance, um, also let in more cold air. So a uh, stove was needed instead of the whale lamp. The whale lamp and 10 people in a house wasn't enough to heat it anymore when you started building like this. But you had the advantage of a higher building standing height, for example. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, that obvious, but still the entrance part of the house is a bit lower. So you're keeping the tradition of the uh, Inuit longhouse um, where you need an extra building or you need an extra structure for entering the house during, for example, a blizzard or a, 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 a fall storm, for example, or spring storm. We have many kinds of storms in Finland. So it's, uh, it's important to have some kind of uh, buffer zone between the weather and your home. Um, I don't know how it is in many other places, but there, that was something new to the Danish colonists, for example. In Denmark, it's quite normal that you just open the front door and you step into the house. Um, some places will have a small room you enter, but, uh, but not always. Um, yeah, I touched upon the windows. They were quite popular because uh, the only windows beforehand 
that uh, that you would have was uh, for stretching, uh, for example, uh, the stomach of a seal across an opening gets some kind of light through. On the left here is an example, a picture I took in East Greenland a couple of years ago um, in a town called Dasila. Um, and here you can actually see the, the remnants of a house that was populated. You know, I think it was until 1982. You see the, the peat walls, with the layers of stone stabilize it, but you only see them on three sides. In the front here, I don't know if it's that obvious on the picture, but the lowest part here is actually a concrete beam that was put in place uh, as a foundation. And on top of that, um, you have the remnants of a wooden wall. So the fourth wall in this house was actually made of wood. And I imagine it's the front door, the, the front of the house that's presenting itself to people walking up to it. Uh, what the roof would look like on this, I simply don't know, but I'm guessing like the old style driftwood beams holding out some kind of roof, but in this case, probably uh, an angled tar paper roof. Um, but I think this, uh, this picture illustrates quite well how people mixed these two styles together. And this three walls was actually something that you could pick up in the immediate area and build by yourself. And you only needed to buy one, one wall and whatever material you needed for the roof. So it's highly efficient in a country where everything wooden and everything else than stone and peat has to be sailed in. And also I should mention that uh, if these houses, uh, these hybrid uh, peat houses were built right uh, and no wind came in around the doors and windows, they were very easy to heat up. They were quite um, quite dirty in the in the spring, the sources tell us, uh, but uh, but very very cozy temperature wise. Um, this is an interesting ex interesting example because this is actually an officially built house made by the I don't know what you call it the the local uh, colonial powers in 1950 as a storage for potatoes in a northern Greenlandic town called uh, Ratasua. Um, it sits on the Disco Island in the middle of the Disco Bay. And if every, anybody knows that area, you'll know that it's isolated and it's, uh, it's a harsh climate. Uh, in the winter time, it gets really rough and, and you're alone. You don't get supplies uh, if the weather is rough. So uh, as the local uh, colonial administration built this house, but they chose to build it in the exact hybrid style that you just saw before, just a little bigger. You can see here that they actually built a uh, European style house with a wooden wall. They had tar paper as a, as a cladding on that, um, built it quite high and then built up a peat wall, presumably to keep the, uh, the inside of the house cool in the summer. Um, this house, if you notice, the, the doors just open straight into the house. There's a little entrance here, but that's probably only to compensate for the thickness of the wall. Um, as you can see, one problem with the peat walls are that these are sagging greatly. It hasn't been used for a couple of decades, um, and it's uh, slowly falling into ruin. Um, it's a bit sad because there's not many of these houses left. Um, and unfortunately, we haven't been able to uh, list or protect it. Uh, so it's a it's a bit of a sore thumb in my if you can say that. Um, well, um, as I said, these peat walls, if you don't maintain them, they fall apart. And that's also how it was in the uh, earlier times that these houses are only temporary houses. So this makes a sort of a bizarre mix because the the house underneath is actually baked, built to last. You have to maintain it, of course, but it's built to last. But the outside wall protecting it is not built to last. And the local uh, administration now don't see the reason to find funds to actually keep these uh, walls maintained. It's a shame because the house sits in the middle of the settlement and everybody passes it every day.
Uh, just checking on time. Yeah. Um, this is another example I quite love. Um, this is the uh, high north of uh, of Greenland, um, up around an area called uh, Ummanak or, uh, or Dundas. Um, it's very close to the Tula Air Base. Um, and it's actually a place that hasn't been inhabited since um, 52, I think, when people got pushed out of this area um, by the authorities because a deal had been made with the Americans to build the airbase. Uh, so people from this area were moved, I think it's 80 kilometers uh, to a different spot. Um, and that's another story and a huge controversy. But um, what's left is a house that sits in the high north of uh, Greenland, way up in the uh, in the Arctic and the polar areas. And it's again a mixture of a Western or European building style. Um, you can see there's some kind of frame keeping up a tongue and groove uh, board wall. You have a peat wall on the outside, and then you have here in this case a really long and narrow and very low entrance. Um, again, facing away from the dominating uh, wind uh, direction. This is a great example, I think, that the further north you go and the, fur the further you go into the cold areas, we generally see these entrance constructions get longer and longer. And in this case, you actually crawl down, you have to crawl lower, the floor in this entrance area is lower than the floor inside the house. My colleague took this picture last year, last summer, um, and this house has been sitting like this unmaintained since at least 1952. So that also speaks for how an Arctic climate actually preserves wood, because I mean, in, in a Danish climate, for example, a typical Northern European climate, this would probably have been nothing but a pile of boards right now, part of uh, wood and a little bit of turf. Um, I couldn't resist this example that's just across the bay from a, another small settlement that was also abandoned in the 50s called the uh, Nyamut. Um, and here you see a house that I find interesting because it has all the elements except for the peat wall. So here's someone who chose to build a European style house. You can e even see it's got a slightly angled roof to lead away melt water or rain. You have the small crawl space uh, entrance construction um, but no peat wall was chosen in this uh, in this case we actually have a small dog house here also um, and this has also just been sitting out so even though it's not protected by a peat wall it's still in a reasonable condition considering how long it's just been left to sit by itself um, but i think these two examples are interesting in the way that they are built in areas where materials are really really scarce and people are holding on to some traditions that are hundreds maybe thousands of years old and mixing them with a recognizable um, european building style this is just a short example to show you that uh, in for example this top uh, right uh, building, which is from uh, 1836 in a small town called Rochinuit, um, the colonial administration house uh, was built in the same way. There they added a, uh, an entrance building. It's not a crawl building uh, or crawl space, or whatever you uh, call it, but, uh, but it's the same idea that you actually add a small annex onto your house. Um, to protect the rest of the house from uh, from the elements when you're walking in and out. Uh, this house in East Greenland has the same principle. You're walking into a small annex and from that one you're walking in. That might not seem revolutionary, but in both cases, these small buildings were actually added later. Especially this one is, uh, if you look at it closely, um, when, when you're standing next to it, you can see that the, that the um, that it's it's differently built. This is a block house or log house, uh, log construction, and these are actually um, vertical um, or uh, lateral uh, boards um, on a timber frame. 
this was also added later. And this is a modern house from the uh, the blue one here is from the uh, 1970s, I would guess 60s probably, um, in Dasila. And um, this is a type house, type built. There's hundreds of these houses in Greenland, and it's been built from the beginning with the same small annex added onto it. I've been focusing on these annex buildings because they're very obvious. Um, there's a lot of other examples, but we don't have the time to go into all of it today. But uh, but this is something that's been actually uh, documented by archaeologists um, at least five or six hundred years back in time, and it still lives in the way houses are built in uh, in Greenland. People probably do it other places also, but in Greenland it's it's systematic that this is the way you build if you want to build a house in Greenland. Wood in the Arctic. As we touched upon before, uh, some abandoned buildings actually hold up quite well. Um, this is the same case here. Um, if anybody knows anything about the uh, tar or wood tar, whatever you call it, uh, you'll see this is uh, horribly unmaintained. Uh, you can see the old layers, the really thick of the wood tar uh, still hanging on, but it's also been washed off or baked off by the sun. Um, but the structure is still, uh, still relatively intact. Uh, I would guess that with a little bit of love, you could probably save this house. Um, and this, in the other picture um, on the right, is uh, is also an abandoned um, sheep stable in South Greenland. It's been abandoned for at least 80, 90, possibly more years, uh, where nobody has maintained anything except maybe nailing a board onto the outside here. Um, and still, the Grip board, which we would call it in Denmark, still does what it's supposed to, leading the water away from the window underneath. Uh, and the, uh, the timbers are actually holding up, even though we can see that they are badly in need of, uh, of paint or what's on. Um, this has something to do with, I need to speed up a bit, I can see. This has something to do with um, Greenland being a very cold and therefore also a very dry place. Um, in this map, you can see the red one is uh, the northern extremes of the Gulf Stream. Um, it goes up here. Some, place, some of it goes between the um, Faroe Islands and, and Scotland here. And some of it turns left south of Iceland, but is kept away from Greenland by uh, the East Greenland current coming down from the North Pole. Um, this cold coastal waters, which are normally just above freezing year round, in the winter time it can get uh, just below zero, but in summertime it's normally not more than maybe three degrees Celsius. Um, and this, in combination with the huge Icelandic uh, Greenlandic uh, ice cap, um, keeps the coastal regions fairly cold. As you can see, we have a temperature average of uh, minus uh, 8 degrees Celsius, 17.6 Fahrenheit in the winter, and uh, plus 11. Uh, that's, an, that's an extreme uh, that I put in here. Um, the extreme average, because it's the average, it's, it's a bit different. Uh, it, it varies a bit up and down the coastlines, but, um, but normally, 11 degrees uh, plus Celsius or 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit is what you would expect of a hot summer day in the middle to South Greenland and maybe only three or four, five degrees in the North Greenland. Um, and that keeps uh, the air quite uh, dry in Greenland. You can also, you can feel it when you're here. If it's 12, 14 degrees Celsius, some people walk around in a t-shirt. Um, because the air is simply just what it feels warmer because it's drier. Um, I have some problems seeing some of my text here because the, the windows just, I'll oh, just look over here. Um, one of the things we're facing is that um, if, the, as the uh, climate predictions say, that we get rising temperatures, then we are very concerned about a rising uh, moisture content also here in Greenland. 
um, because we have a um, average uh, precipitation of 628 uh, millimeters per year. This is actually something like 350 millimeters less than areas in Greenland that uh, in in Norway. Uh, sorry, uh, that are very compatible to to Greenlandic uh, uh, climate, but but it's 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 not very much, um, and most of it is snow. But if we get rising temperatures, then most of this uh, precipitation would probably come come down as water, um, and we get most of it in uh, September to January. So it's the cold, it's the winter season normally, uh, and we are starting to see longer periods of rain in the middle of winter. Last year, it rained on the ice uh, sheet uh, on the Greenlandic ice cap in the middle of winter for the first time in recorded history. So uh, we are worried about that. The rain versus snow factor. Happy, I, I'm going to jump in. Um, yeah, I don't no. want you to to rush. If you, if you want to take some more time, I'm sure um, uh, people won't mind. I, for one, am kind of quite interested in where you're going with this. Um, okay. Um, so you don't feel you have to rush. And okay. Okay. Crack on. Then glad you say that because uh, one now I have this map up. I'd like to add another interesting thing that doesn't have anything to do with uh, with rain or or climate or anything, but this map, when you're looking at it, also explains where the driftwood in uh, Greenland that we have, where it comes from, because uh, popular knowledge says that the Canada and the US are very close, so of course uh, driftwood must, must just come across the uh, the Davis Strait or through the Baffin Bay. Um, this is not true. As you see, you observe the, uh, the ocean currents, whatever driftwood we get, in Greenland comes from Siberia. So it comes from over here, drifts all the way down the eastern uh, coastline. And this coastline is also very, very heavily iced uh, in the winter and spring seasons. When you fly over from, uh, from Iceland to Greenland, you can, uh, you can see how the co currents shape the sea ice. Um, that's quite fascinating. But as the driftwood then travels down south around Greenland, and it has to travel all the way up the coastline to reach this red dot area, which is uh, the northernmost settlement, uh, Ranok, which is where the people were moved after the construction of the Tula base. So whatever wood they have in Ranok, which is very, very little, is uh, actually driftwood all the way from Siberia. Um, that also explains why uh, traditional houses in the North Greenlandic area on the west coast are primarily built with whale bones, uh, for example, ribs from whales, instead of driftwood to hold up the roof. Um, so that is the source of wood in Greenland traditionally. Nowadays we get it imported on ships, so um, we can actually order what kind of wood we want. All right. Um, I couldn't resist this, this example of how well uh, a wooden construction can actually keep up uh, in Greenland without any maintenance at all. Uh, this is a building from uh, 1880 in uh, again on the Disco Island, um, which, as I said, has a very harsh climate. And this building has been left sitting for at least 50 years. Uh, it's unclear how long ago since it was in, in any kind of use, and it's probably a lot longer since it was maintained. Um, you can see the shingles have been blown up in, blown up in storms, and the shingles have here actually been laid on top. I don't know if you can see it, but they've been laid on top of the old clinker build roof. So the roof underneath is probably, I'm guessing it's the original roof. I don't know because uh, there's a uh, sparse history on this um, on this building, but um, but everything has been blown off, and even some of the clinker boards have been blown, blown off. So you have a hole in the roof here. You have the walls crumbling, either because people have taken stones or simply because what little mortar has been used has been washed away. So everything is falling apart in this building, but, but it's still standing. And if you look at the other picture, that's from the inside, and the construction are still to my carpenter eye at least quite solid. I would 
actually think that I could bring this house back to a reasonable condition quite easily, actually. You have to get some mason work done. You have to get a new roof laid on. But the, the timbers look sound, and I'm positive that the air will dry them out in a couple of years if you just close the roof up. So this is how well a construction like this actually holds up in a in the current and former Greenlandic climate. But as I was saying, we don't know what's going on, what's going to happen in the, in the future. And if anybody has the chance to go to uh, Disco Island or Ardasuak, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic place. Um, as I was saying, we're worried about rain instead of snow uh, because uh, most of the uh, colonial houses, um, and that is also most of the houses that are listed here in Greenland, are built for snow, but not built for rain. Um, and that means that uh, most of the old houses actually have very little overhang or, or eaves, uh, I believe it's called eaves, um, which means that if water runs off these roofs, it drips down really close to, uh, to the sides of the house. So it either just runs down the side if the wind is in the wrong direction, or it'll hit the ground very close to the foundations and the bottom of the, of the, of the house and then splat it back up. Um, and there are no uh, no gutters. Uh, traditionally, houses in Greenland have been built with uh, no gutters because they just break off when there's uh, like a half, uh, maybe full meter of snow on the roof. On the roof. Um, so we have no means of leading water away from the from the house or from the facade. Um, and as I was saying, with the with the drip uh, from the roof from the eaves. Um, in in a case like this, for example, the the, the blackish brownish house, um, it's a it's a storage uh, warehouse, a really small house in the Italy set, um, and it's a timber frame house with the uh, with the um, what do you call it? one on two boards uh, on the outside, um, and in if this house was built in uh, Denmark, for example, where most of the building tradition comes from, um, then um, Around the, the bottom of the house, there would be uh, about a, a meter out, for, out from the house, there would be small round stones set in the, set in the ground. Uh, in, in Denmark, it's called uh, pigsteen. Uh, I'm guessing it will translate into sort of spike stones or something. Uh, when the water drops from the roof hit those, they disperse into smaller drops and don't splatter back up on the building. We don't see that anywhere in Greenland because it hasn't been necessary so far. Um, but that's a huge problem now. Um, so there's no uh, there's no dispersion of runoff, and there's very little focus on drainage. Um, and most of the uh, buildings are built, as you can see here, really close to the ground. Also, um, so they're designed for minimal use of uh, material, which is also why the, the eaves are not very very uh, very big. Um, and many of them were built as uh, assembly kits in Denmark or Norway at some point, then shipped to Greenland and put together by uh, by carpenters or handymen uh, in the spot, uh, which also means that there was not much learning on the spot and then adjusting building styles. It was just Danish carpenters building something, packing it on a ship, sending it to Greenland, and never seeing it again. Someone else put it up um, and no feedback uh, in the process. Uh, to touch at the end here on some of the challenges uh, that we face, um, most of the uh, old colonial buildings have, for some of them, for a couple of centuries, uh, been painted with uh, uh, paint made, for example, from a seal or a whale oil. Um, some have been painted with uh, paints made on based on animal wood, uh, wood tar, uh, with or without any color pigmentation. is uh, is very widespread, and so is uh, linseed oil paint uh, with or without uh, pigmentation. 
Uh, and we also see in some places that, uh, but that's mostly insides that uh, so for example, glue paint made from bone or skin uh, has been used. This uh, two pictures here at the bottom are from um, a colleague of mine that a couple of years ago uh, did some experimentation based on an old recipe we found on making uh, seal oil paint. Um, and it actually doesn't smell as bad as you would think when you boil seal blubber and then uh, make uh, paint from, from this recipe. Um, an interesting short story um, is that um, some local painters that were working on a house close by came over and had a good laugh about uh, how stupid this was. Um, and then she talked them into trying uh, the paint when it was finished uh, on the house that she was experimenting with. And uh, they were very surprised at how easy the paint was to uh, uh, to use. It just sort of um, not stuck to the brush and, and, and got spread really easily. And, uh, and, and they estimated that it would only have to paint paint uh, twice uh, to actually have a, uh, a really good color. Um, the, the main problem here in Greenland, especially connected to the uh, increase in, in rain and precipitation in, in total, is that um, since the 60s, many of the uh, historical houses, I'd say maybe 80%, has been painted over with either acrylic paint or plastic paint. Um, and in many places, they simply just rot uh, away as if they've been put in a plastic bag with uh, with some water, um, and that is a almost unmanageable task to uh, try and clean all that off. So it's a very slow process uh, where we guide uh, local uh, craftsmen in how to clean out as much as of this and then add, for example, in seed oil or, or wood paint uh, or wood tar instead. Um, we also see a lot of problems in the quality of the timber used today in, in repairs. Um, and that's the standard that I'm getting. Everybody faces that most timber today are produced uh, in industrial scale uh, and are not very good quality. We see a lot of people wanting to use pressure treated wood. Um, we can we can guide uh, building owners or, 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 or craftsmen on both of those uh, problems. So we, we normally get a solution to that. But the uh, main the main task, uh, the main threat we see right now are the really, really stark rising market prices. And in Greenland, you would normally have to uh, to go a price times two what it is, for example, in Denmark, where we get most of our materials simply because of the long transport by ship. Um, so most building owners uh, don't really have the money right now to do what's right with, uh, with their buildings and, and follow the law, basically. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that's a big problem for us right now. And that was it. Fantastic. Fantastic. I, um, thanks so much, uh, Jeffrey. Um...